you should all know who she is because you're here. Um, I'm like so super grateful that she's coming. Like um, she came out for workshops in March, I think it was in New Zealand, and I wrote to her and I was like, please come to Sydney. And and um, we had Andrea Siodmuk come as well. She was coming via Sydney for that same workshop thing that was going on in New Zealand. And Liz is like, I can't come, but I'll be back. So we kind of we've been talking about that um, since then and working quite closely to work on the toolkits and stuff for this. And yeah, I'm just so happy that Liz has come to spend so generous with her time and experience. So yeah, thank you. Okay. So I'll, um, I'll just talk a little bit about what happened over the last couple of days. And then, and then I have um, a long presentation, but it, it's mostly pictures. Um, but th there's a lot I wanted to, to share, kind of what I've been doing and um, where it's been going. So for the last two days with advanced practitioners, um, what we did was focus on sort of three different um, stages of activity in collaborating together to um, imagine and express um, what I've come to term as the collective dream for this organization. Or I don't, it's not really an organization, it's a community. And um, we started, um, we put people, Jack's put people into teams that were div as diverse as possible. The participants were um, social change makers, social innovation people, as well as um, people working in at the NGOs. So it was a very diverse, each team was very diverse. Um, <clears throat> four teams of five people each. The first exercise was a paper-based um, paper expression of what the field is like now, what it's like today. Um, to be working in social change, okay? And um, it's important to kind of acknowledge and talk about the current situation before asking people to imagine what the future could hold. Um, so those, um, those representations were then shared. And I think we have, do we have, do we have some left over? That, I mean, you, we can. We've got. There's a whole lot of stuff on the ledge there, and then there's more models at the back. Okay. Um, so if you if you're curious, you can take a look yes. um, at some of these. Um, this first exercise, the the two dimensional mapping, is quite similar to what you'll get hands on experience with today, because uh, we thought it would be great to spread this out to a larger group and get more thoughts in terms of what the field is like today. Now in the two-day workshop, what we did then is um, have them explore the future community, the future situation, with a focus on more three-dimensional materials, um, which would include um, um, pipe cleaners, blocks, balls, uh, Play-Doh, um, various kinds of things, which gave them the ability to not just sort of map it out, but to build it up to map it out and build it up. So their futures, um, which you can see on the ping pong table, um, were expressed in that way. And it was, it was quite interesting to make um, the comparison between working two-dimensionally with a variety of materials versus three-dimensionally is different. Unfortunately, we don't have time to bring you through both of those activities, but um, we did want it, we saved out um, what they made to sort of give you a sense for what was going on there. Um, the the, the three-dimensional, let's see, where is the, the three-dimensional exercise then um, was um, inspired by this notion of cognitive maps, these maps we have in our heads of the places that we, that we know, and we urge the teams to think of them in terms of what are the landmarks, what are the paths, what are the zones, what are the edges, and what are the districts, and so what we had from the four um, landscapes then is we now have um, a three-dimensionally represented collective um, dream for where this um, social change community wants to be. Um, and we've identified, where that, we've identified the key landmarks across all of those visions. And I believe some of the, the Slack discussions will focus on these landmarks that we see in the future. We had a third exercise then where the teams took um, 
took challenges um, that lie somewhere in between the current and the future. And at that point, they could um, represent their ideas two-dimensionally, three-dimensionally, any way, any way they chose to, to work. I'd just like to add there quickly. So there were some really amazing ideas that came up, and we actually want to bring them to life. So through the Slack channel, we'll be sharing those ideas. And if there's something that you would like to be involved with, like one of them was um, like looking at um, like a sort of online repository of case studies and tools and sharing and places, things like that. But there's other things. So just to put it out there, come to Slack and you'll see more and get involved. Yeah, a really broad, yeah. a really broad set of issues from yeah. sort of psychological yeah. support systems to stuff, sharing stuff. Like Full Cup Society was looking at well-being and um, meeting to come together to support each other when, you, you know, because it can be quite hard doing social change type work. There's a lot of interesting things that came up. Um, so it, it, it was a um, really productive two days. I think everybody felt sort of the, um, the sense of, yeah, we have a vision. We are connected. Uh, the challenge then is to keep it going and to keep it growing and to share it. And so Jax's team is hard at work. Um, Everything was videotaped, photographed, sharing it so that other people can then become involved. So you will participate in sort of a segment of this in a hands-on way um, and we'll have, um, but what, what we're going to challenge you with is with a paper-based tool, have you used the materials that we've provided to map out the current situation in social change? and? you're thinking about where it could be going at, in the same sort of session, um, which is a lot, which is a lot to do. But I think okay. it'll happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we'll, uh, um, I'm optimistic that it can be done. Uh, but but it, it, it's hard work and it's fun. So anyway, that's what we've been doing. What, now I need to move to a different presentation. Let's see. Here it is. Okay. Whew, good. It wasn't working earlier. Okay, so um, this is an introduction to, to co design. And I'd like to start with a definition of design so that you know where I'm coming from. I'm not trained as a designer. I'm trained as a psychologist and an anthropologist, but I've been working directly with designers for close to 40 years now. Um, so I'm not, um, so I, I work in design, but I work in it um, from a slightly different perspective um, than somebody trained in design. And so I've um, adopted Henrik Geddenred's definition of design is an inquiry into the future situation of use. So it m makes it clear that it's much broader than um, product services systems um, and so forth, but that key to the definition is people um, in situations or experiences in the future. So co-design following that definition is the collaborative exploration of future situations of use. But there's many different, uh, people are using that term co-design in many different ways and at many different levels, um, particularly in the US, as I'll get to. I'm not sure that it's quite as chaotic here. Um, but you can talk about co-designing just within a community or an organization. So you can have the stakeholders in a company collaborating about future situations of use and that may or may not involve other stakeholders or end users. I mean, that is a form of co-design. Um, sometimes the co-designing is between pe people, between organizations or communities, and sometimes it's between an organization or community and the people that are being served by that community or organization. Most of the work that I've done is really at the third level, which is focusing on bringing 
the end users or the potential end users, um, if you want to call them that, the citizens, bringing the people who are going to be served by what is ultimately designed, but bringing them into the co-design process um, as valuable contributors. Okay, so I do have I do have that sort of um, focus. Um, how many? Let me. How? Um, let's just do a show of hands here, in terms of um, which sort of level of co-designing you're most familiar with. So I'll go through each one, and I just want to get a show of hands, if you don't mind. So how many people? Um, have more sort of have heard more or have done more in terms of co-designing just within organizations oh okay so that's maybe 30 percent of this group and you can raise your hand more than once and what about co-designing between groups or organizations just a couple and how many are more familiar with the co-design being between the um, the organization and the people being served in the end. Okay, so that's more little over half. Okay, so that's interesting. I wasn't um, aware that there was as much sort of within organization co-design going on. It's just for yeah. I'm just curious. Um, this is um, the ladder of citizen participation, Arnstein, 1969. Um, how many of you are familiar with? Okay, good. Yeah, I didn't become familiar with it until much, much later um, in my career. Can, hmm? Can you take pictures? Wait, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're gonna. The slides will go up on something. Slack. Yeah. Oh, every. Yeah. 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 Feel free to. Um, take pictures. Um, considering it was published in 1969, it, it's amazing how long it took for me to be aware of it, but I, I think it's um, in a way that it, it shows that uh, when people use the term co-design, sometimes they're really not, you know, they're involving people but not in a very direct way. Um, you know, we would say they're, it, it's really not participating it's just sort of letting people know what's going on or letting them think they're being involved when their opinions aren't really being used or heard. Um, and so I think some at the U.S. we call this, you know, giving it lip service. It's like, oh yeah, we're doing co-design, but they're not really um, using what they have. So there's many different um, levels of co-design happening. Um, my um, my dream, my wish is that it always be as high up as possible that the people being served um, through design, the people being brought in as co-designers are truly um, the owners um, and the decision makers um, to the extent that that's possible. Um, co-design takes place um, or can take place through the entire design and development process. And so I've, I use this squiggle to refer to what happens in the front end of design before you know what it is that you're going to design. There's a lot of sort of exploratory um, action, um, research, and so forth. So this um, refers to the front end where you're trying to figure out what to design, and then the design process um, is a lot more focused in on designing the thing or the service, bringing it to market, or bringing it to the people, and so forth. So co-design co -design can be taking place at any stage along the process, and in fact, it is taking place at all those stages. So what I did a few years back is looked, just went to Google and typed in co-design. Um, I think I looked at participatory design as well, just to look at which companies were doing, which companies were saying they were doing it. And then I started to plot it um, along the design development process to see like what are they saying they're doing and where in the design development process is it. 
And what was interesting was this sort of different levels of, um, I'd say, true participation. Where, and then this, this, this curve where those organizations that were working very early in the front end in using co-design to figure out what to design, um, the values that they were expressing about what they did had to do with sort of the, the value to the society or the value to the community and the importance of ownership um, of that solution. And then at the other end, we had organizations um, using co-design mainly to drive business to their products um, and calling it co-design. So we have like a Doritos um, chips having a big co-design contest for letting people name the new chip. Which, um, okay, so I, that is, that's co-design in a way, but the product's already done, pa you know, done, packaged, delivered, and they're like bringing a lot of attention to themselves, um, saying, you know, join, you know, join this co-design contest or whatever, um, name our new chip and you'll get so much money or whatever. So this is, so the nature of what co-design is, is, really, really different um, along, um, you know what I mean, the different stages. In the middle, you know, we have companies that um, are using co-design in the product or service development process. But um, it's more sort of on the middle of the, the ladder of participation. Okay, they're bringing people in as co-designers, but they're really not letting the people own it, um, you know, it's still under under tight control in that way. And so many other different companies um, could be placed there. Um, I think like IKEA, so this was done a number of years ago, I see IKEA moving, um, I see IKEA moving sort of in their attitude um, that companies, um, you know, may shift here. Um, so you see there's sort of this societal level of value. Um, the value for co-design here is better stuff, better products, better services, and the value of co-design there is financial. Drive more people to our website, make more people buy our product, and we'll make more money. Um, and those are all valid. You can probably tell that my, I find this a little more interesting <laughs> um, and challenging. But the fact is, co-design is, um, is all of those things. And so, um, in a nutshell then, what we have here is co-designing is a mindset, and co-designing is the way you work, and how you work, and it flavors everything that you do. Um, here, co-designing is, it, it's a method, or a set of methods. You pull them out, and you use them when relevant. Um, and here, you know, co-designing is really like it's a tool or a technique or it's a trick or it's, a, um, it's just sort of a, you know, a, a thing you use to um, attract attention um, to say, yeah, we're cool, we're doing co-design. Uh, any, any comments on this? In your country, do you, do you have these three clusters? No, yeah? Like yeah? So you have the third cluster? Up there? Definitely. Absolutely. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's, <laughs> huh? it's called crowd sharing that um, I'm familiar with for that further. Crowd sharing? Yeah. 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 Um, this is a framework that I've used for a number of years that outlines um, how to approach and how to organize a co design process. And it's really very simple, and it's saying that you should um, ideally engage people through making, telling, and enacting. Okay, and so here, assume that we're at the stage where we've gathered people 
and they were giving them the opportunity to express ideas for future experience. <coughs> okay, um, imagine that they've already had a chance to vent their frustrations or their fears about the current situation. Um, and what we're going to focus on now is ways for them to um, participate directly um, in the design process at the front end um, through these activities. So you can start with any approach, making, telling, or enacting. You can move in any direction. Um, you might start by having people tell stories about their current situation, their dreams for the future, make things that would help them realize their dreams. Um, you might have people make visions or artifacts for the future and then have them enact, like actually pretend or act out um, future scenarios um, with others in the group. So within each of the categories, there's an infinite number of methods. So these are more categories of methods, um, but it does, um, it, it makes it clear that it needs to be more than just the telling, the verbalization of ideas, um, that ideally people are engaged um, through making things telling as well as demonstrating or acting things out with their bodies, like testing things out. Um, the focus, you'll have a focus today primarily on the making and the telling, um, just simply because there isn't time to go full circle here, but maybe what we'll do is after the making and the telling have a discussion on, okay, what would a good enacting mm -hmm. um, scenario be after this, for example. Um, and I'll show slides um, from past <coughs> projects on all of these. So I have a lot of different examples. Um, and first I'll just start with just um, images of methods and then I have a couple short cases that are less focused on the commercial world and more focused on social uh, kinds of issues. Most, most of my practice has been in the commercial world and then a stint in architecture. Five years ago I joined the faculty at the design school at the Ohio State University. I joined as a full-time faculty member and so the nature of my work changed dramatically. Um, and so my work now is pretty much, um, a lot of it is healthcare related um, and across many different domains of healthcare. And when I invite my design students to choose their own projects, um, I've, I've seen, and I've been teaching part-time for many, many years, the interest in social issues relative to commercial issues in the design projects chosen. They get to choose their own projects for doing co-design. So there's this huge rise in interest in doing socially related projects. Um, and the students are <laughs> excited enough to go find these. Pro sometimes I find the projects for them. Sometimes they find them on their own. So it's just been interesting to me to see the shift from students just wanting to get ready for the commercial design world to today students are wanting to go into um, social change and social innovation um, instead. Um, so exploring future experience through making, telling, and enacting. These three categories can play a role at all different stages in the design and development process. Most, most of my examples are here, because once you sort of get into an area, you tend to, you know, get known for working in that area. Um, and so most of the examples are in the front end where we're exploring the experience in order to figure out what to design or how to design something. Uh, a little digression about creativity, individual and collective creativity. A lot of what we know about creativity is based on work that psychologists have done um, and most of that's been focused on individual creativity, okay, how individual people are creative. In fact, most of it's been developed on people who are known for being creative. 
which means a lot of the work on creativity isn't that useful for what we do in design um, and especially collaboratively. Um, but a lot of, but we know a lot about um, individual creativity. There's the assumption there that it's something that happens in the head, okay, of eminently creative people. More recent research is pointing out how important emotion, um, the emotional state of the person is in creativity in that positive emotional states are associated with higher levels of creativity. So when you're having fun, um, you're, you know, you're more creative as a whole. So fun is related to creativity. Um, research now is looking at the role of the body and acknowledging that creativity isn't just in the head, but creativity is in the body and that moving the body can also be a form that, or uh, moving the body can also provoke um, and facilitate creativity. So there's um, methods now of, you know, walking and talking, or there's actual peer-reviewed journals showing walking and talking can lead to more creative output than sitting and talking. There's studies looking at how many ideas people generate when they're sitting in a box versus sitting outside of the box. So it's sort of a, you know, the pun of being in the box or out of the box, they actually tested that and people out of the box could generate more ideas. Okay, so the role of um, moving the body, um, standing versus sitting, walking versus staying in one place, um, get up and move, um, if you want to be creative, go for a walk, do something else. And just um, the role of the places um, that you're in, in being creative, matter. And this is an ideal creative space. We have natural light. We have high ceilings. We have tables that move and chairs that move. And there's no rules for where anything needs to go. So there's a lot of... Um, openness and flexibility in this space and we very carefully prepared materials um, as well that um, we want you to explore in order to um, facilitate your creativity. Now this is all about sort of individual creativity and what matters. Emotions matter, um, moving the body matters, space matters. Um, in bringing people together to be creative, the standard method is brainstorming, which is sort of like a bunch of individuals having ideas and then sharing the ideas and then the sharing of the ideas leads to more ideas. And you write them all down, um, usually on post-it notes so you can move them around. Um, and what you end up with a lot of times is a lot of post-it notes but it then takes some work to figure out what to do with that creative output. You know, like how do you summarize it? How do you take it to the next step? What does it really mean? And so what I've been working on is a state that's different from brainstorming, and it looks more like this, where this is a lot of people, um, they're, they're, they're touching in the creative process. Now, they, they might, it might not be physical, it could be emotional. They could be sharing or joking um, or eating together, but they are working as, as one. And the idea here, it isn't so much a bunch of little ideas, but they're all working um, on big ideas together um, because the tools and the materials have been designed to facilitate that sort of communication. But even better than th this picture is the picture that we have in this room where every individual is different from the others. Because I assume some people here are designers, other people come from different backgrounds, have different experiences um, in their profession, and so when you have a group of people collaborating together on something, making it together with materials that have been created for that making, um, 
it, it's a situation of transdisciplinarity um, where no one expert, so to speak, is calling the shots or leading the path, but everybody then is um, touching um, and making things together. And, and so that's the situation that we want to give you the opportunity to, to experience. So now I'll show a lot of examples of the making, the telling and the enacting. I'll focus on the making. Um, because I imagine that you all have a, a lot of experience with telling as, as a um, group of methods, and I'll show some enacting. Um, so here, what's getting made is going to be different in the different parts of the design process. So the, up front, they might be the normal making maps, um, maps or landscapes, um, whereas once you know what it is, it might be more of a model. The making might be more like a traditional design prototype here. So the making extends, but what you're making is different. And the idea behind making is to put together simple and ambiguous components into toolkits. It's a very deliberate set of things. And um, they're made for, purpose, for a specific purpose such that people, some of the toolkits are about expressing memories. Um, or dreams, ideas, fears, unmet needs. So the nature of the toolkit then changes depending upon what we're asking people to think about and make. And if you've prepared people for the make activity by having them sort of think about the experience at hand, think about their current situation, um, if the people have been prepared for that activity, a lot of times you don't really have to tell them a whole lot about what they're supposed to do. Um, they, um, they already know how to express themselves um, with the materials. There's many different methods for making. Um, this is the short list. And all of these methods have been published in peer-reviewed academic journals. Um, the list of make methods that covers everything you find in peer-reviewed journals, blogs. You know, if you just look at everything, um, the list of make methods goes out the door. It, it's infinite. It just keeps growing. Hmm? Um, I'm not sure if it's hard to so do my ignorance, but is it prototypes? Yes. A, a prototype is, um, is, it's like a prototype that's made to provoke. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it might be sort of a, a device or a gizmo. Um, it's, it's a three-dimensional thing, and you might present it and say, well, this is what it does. Show me how you would use it in your life. And it could be, um, it could have very controversial sort of negative implications that you want people to start to think about. It's kind of related to design fiction, you know, the artifacts that come out of design fiction where, um, you know, something is made to get people to think, to provoke them to think. But a prototype then is, it's, it's, it's a prototype for provoking. Can I just share a story about a prototype which I know it was to look just explain to me <laughs> that you'll find amusing. Um, on Friday, the person that cleans my house showed me something that he invented that he wanted to show my husband who's a builder, which was a drill with a toilet brush attached. <laughs> and he pulled it out of the back and he said, your husband might be interested in having a piece of which I invented. And, you know, spun it. It's a prototype. He's saying, Here's this thing that's a drill that you use for building, which is very macho. Yeah. And I've stuck a toilet brush on the end of it. He was going to plug it in and then put it in the toilet? No. <laughs> 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 it's actually operated. It's a drill. Oh, it's a battery operated. Yeah. <laughs> I thought he was going to plug it in. Yeah. There's a new model. It's called the sound. Yeah, OK. OK. Yeah. I'm, going, I'm thinking safety. So, yeah. It's true. It's so true. So basically, when I went inside, I was like, Genius, man. It's like, who wants to clean the toilet like that, right? 
Yeah. There's this drill, which is totally macho. Right, it's kind of like how do we find out what works by discovering what doesn't work? Yeah. yeah. Well, or you might discover that future implications. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Especially with new technology, it's it's always it's, a lot of times it's seen as it's always going to be great, but it isn't always great. And we know that, so anyway, sometimes you need to provoke people. That's, that's, I'm actually going to make one at home. So I'm not going to. I'm just going to show um, examples. Um, so here, a, a couple is um, using a carefully selected set of materials. It's really just paper shapes. And they're creating a a future, um, a future vision for their life together as a couple. So, so this is a high technology project with Microsoft exploring how people want to live in the future. Uh, but at this stage, there's nothing about computers. There's nothing about Microsoft. It's just it's about living um, in the future. That's sort of a first stage is to um, let them dream. And so they would make it, and then they would present it. Um, and that might be an opening activity that we have um, with them. This one is a lot more sort of specific. And we are actually um, studying paper towels. And the mom is creating, um, there's very specific pictures and words. And she's um, creating some sort of timeline about paper towel usage, very, very mundane, very concrete. Um, but the client is interested in the front end of exploration in order to rethink um, this part of their business. Um, a lot of times with the making, we get extra people in the sessions. Um, so here we're in the home, which gives us an opportunity to observe and that sort of thing. And a lot of times working in the home, then we get, we, you know, we recruit one person and we end up getting the family. And um, which is great because we usually bring materials for children um, as well um, to get them involved if they're so inclined. Um, this is a student working, um, a student from India doing her research in India about communication um, between family members during the monsoon season. Um, so again, you can imagine every different toolkit, every make tool is, is different. And it's designed specifically for the people, the question, the situation, the time frame you have, and so forth. Um, and then what, that, what it is that they're making, again, changes. This is Brian's um, self-perception map. So Brian, from a large set of images, Brian said, this is how I want to be perceived, um, everything in here. So we're understanding Brian um, as a person. Again, we're very much front-ended here. Um, but Brian probably couldn't tell us all of this with words alone. Um, and certainly the prioritization here is, is key. This is a school teacher's um, mapping of the school year, what she does at school, what she does at home. And we're, we're understanding here um, her current, this is actually a current experience in order to have her then jump start and move into the future. Um, here we have, this is a student, a graduate student project. These are endocrinologists and they're mapping out an ideal process of the communication between an endocrinologist and young people with type 1 diabetes. So here the endocrinologist came up with a timeline, the students with type 1 diabetes came up with a timeline, they presented to each other and then they collaborated on one um, and came up with the concept that we're in, in, for an app to facilitate this process that's currently in development um, because it, it was a great idea. Um, civic innovation, here this, this is some work with groups um, from Columbus, Ohio um, giving them the opportunity then to express their dreams um, for future community um, organization. Again, um, toolkits designed specifically. You'll notice that when more people are involved, the stuff gets bigger. Um, the materials get bigger, the paper gets bigger, so that everybody uh, can be involved in the same time. Um, I have many. Um, hospital project examples. This is a patient's 
um, dream for the ideal hospital experience. Um, these are nurses um, working together, rethinking how um, a unit within a hospital could work. You, you notice here, none of, the, none of the pieces are shaped like rooms because we don't, we don't want them to design the floor, that architects are going to design the floor. Um, what we're wanting them to explore is the flow of communication, the flow of people, the flow of trash, the flow of materials. Um, and so everything is um, round and circular in that way. Um, and so here you can see um, this team's representation. Now this, this was interesting. We spent a lot of time on a page of words. Um, there's a whole sheet you can see here. We spent hours getting the right list of words. And we had nurses on our team, you know, so we had a really good list of words. And you notice they didn't use any of them. <laughs> they didn't need any of them. You know, they looked at the words and oh, this is what we're into. Um, and so here when you're dealing with this level of expertise, you just you need to just get them started. Um, and let them go. Um, and so then they would explain what it is um, that this means. These are former <laughs> heart patients given the opportunity to express their dreams for the ideal hospital room. Um, and so you see it's a combination of actual, you know, a, a, a real size space and these are all scaled to the room. So there's that reality, the constraints of the space of the room, but then there's a lot of other items um, that you currently wouldn't find in a hospital room and then just giving them the opportunity to dream. And what we do then at, after each team presents their ideal hospital room, all of the teams vote on everybody's rooms with heart stickers. And um, it's pretty clear that a lot of the other people around the table liked what was going on here. So what happens in these situations, everybody comes up with a different solution so to, or a different expression. Um, and you know, just sort of getting the, the heart stickers helps us then see what really makes um, a difference to the, heart, to the heart patients. There's an initial stage of research of sort of ethnographic exploration of seeing how they live. Okay. So we, we will have done prior research. So I did a lot of projects with hardcore gamers for Microsoft. It's not something, so you know, we, we had to go through a stage of learning what hardcore gamers, um, and that's where that self-perception triangle, that was a hardcore gamer. We, we went through, you know, we learned about what matters to them. Um, and the hospital project, we're lucky in the firm that we were to have two of the planners be former <laughs> nurses. Um, so we, we, could, we could jump steps there um, in that way because they, they knew the, the lingo and the terminology. But you might talk to your observing patients yeah. and doctors. And yeah. yeah, yeah, there would be a preliminary mm -hmm. step. And on the word list, there's always blanks, mm -hmm. at least three blanks. So we're saying, yeah, well, we don't know, right. Mm -hmm. um, when you look across like, three to five case studies or projects that you've done. What do you, what have you said in common to kick these things off? I, I imagine you just don't roll up and say like, can you, maybe you do it. Can, can you show me your sort of like ideal dream experience of X? Like what, what do you say to kick off these, these sessions? Oh, you mean in a workshop, how do they start? Yeah. Okay. Usually people who come to the workshop have homework. <coughs> they, they have something to do before they show up. Because we want them thinking deeply about, say, the current experience. So the nurses would come having documented, sort of in diary style, what do they do during the day, how do they feel about it? What what pisses them off about their work? You know what I mean? They would just, they would have come having thought about, documented, taken pictures of the current situation. So that would have like a little 
brief, either verbal or written, that yeah, visualizes it. Yeah. yeah, that sometimes we send a workbook. The workbook <laughs> might have two pages, it might have 30. Okay, if we're paying them to participate, we can ask them to do more. If they're volunteers, the nurses would get a two-page workbook because they're volunteering. Some of these consumer product projects, they would get a big workbook and they would, you know, they would get paid for their time. So they would have filled out the, won't take them if they haven't done their homework. They'll come having done their homework um, which gives us a huge amount of background information about them. Sometimes they send the homework to us a week before the session starts and we analyze the homework before the session in order to make the session more um, <coughs> time effective and focused. You know what I mean? So but if, if they send us their homework a week ahead and we analyze it, we know a lot about them already. Um, so they've done their homework, they come to the session, usually they share some of their homework. Um, and, the, and when they're sharing then, they hear things from all of the others. They learn a lot about each other based on what we ask them to share. Um, and a lot of times we'll ask them to share something that's kind of personal or emotional. Always asking for the first person. If they're gonna share something kind of personal, I always ask the first person person to be, a, who would like to go first? I don't just go around Robin and say, okay, you're first, um, but I, you know, who would like to share this page? And somebody will always go, I will, I will. Um, and then once one person shared, the others share. So they, they do homework, they share something about themselves, um, and then they engage in maybe two or three or four or five different activities of making, telling, and enacting over a two hour to three hour period. So it's really tightly um, orchestrated um, just to get as much as we can out of, out of a limited amount of time. And the people may be strangers when they first come or they may be related, it just depends. Does that answer the question? Yeah. A lot of preparation, yeah. Is there, um, I'm not very specific, but is there any specific order in which you do these sort of activities? Because I guess for us, um, we have used it to involve in the sessions. And the one that we struggle more to involve people is in the making. The one so that you want more? The struggle more to involve people is in the making. Yeah. Um, I guess people tend to tell stories uh, and not stories, but it's always harder to. Um, involved and to use the tools, or if they have heard some sort of materials, for them to feel different scenarios, so different contexts. We, I guess the hard part is always to get them building things. Do you have any tips on how do you engage people to do that? Um, I think you have to let them ease into it. We try to put a simple making in the workbook. So they can do it at home on their own time. They can take as much time as they want, and then they might present it when they come. Um, but we start with the very simple making that's more concrete. So I, I don't usually have trouble getting people to make, um, just because there's, you know, it's planned. Like the, it's when the session is planned, we are planning not. Yeah, we're interested in what we want to get from the research, but a big part of the planning is planning the experience they have to make sure that they're comfortable making. But, but it's, it's, um, it, it takes a lot of practice to do that naturally or well. culturally sensitive. So the toolkit you'll get was co-developed 
between me and Jax's team. Because this is my first trip to Australia. So I couldn't make that toolkit. But I think certain, <coughs> certain tools and materials, um, they, they are very culturally sensitive. So using, so I'll I have a few slides of using puppets to get people to enact. Um, in the US, um, I have to use them very carefully and I always have to give people, well, you can use puppets or you can use something else. Because some people just would feel stupid using the puppets. Um, I did some workshops in Spain and it was, <laughs> they really, they, they're really puppet people. <laughs> it was amazing. And it, well, I had to stop the thing. You know what I mean? It was like, I've never, I couldn't even imagine puppets. But like if I went to Finland, I wouldn't even bring the puppet. <laughs> You know, I, I just wouldn't even try it. And then I did, I went to Japan and I brought a couple puppets. And I was really, I was surprised that, because um, not, not everybody, you know, it wasn't like everybody had to use them. Um, but sometimes you, you are surprised. But there, yeah, the cultural differences are, are really big. Um, a lot of times what we'll do now, being at a university, we, we have diverse cultural groups. We can kind of pilot test things on people from that country if we need to. We can get help preparing things. The best is to have people on your team um, from there, but if that's not possible, um, yeah, it, it really matters a lot. But yeah, puppets are really culturally sensitive. I didn't bring them just because of space. I'm just quite interested now in what happens after you've done the work you've collected the leads, you've got so the interpretation and the idea of you know, in some way, transforming it down to either you know, it's a physical, or a physical thing that would happen, a practical thing that would happen. Because it's a very, that's what I find difficult really now when we start on collecting it. Is that again, coming back to, from a very diverse, nice thing where everyone is involved, it comes back to, you know, one or two people in some ways. And it's a big responsibility because you, you are interpreting things Okay, so that, that's, that's like a question that has a book for an answer. <laughs> but but I, I, would, I would say that the short answer is the analysis interpretation and interpretation is also collaborative with ideally different kinds of people, research people and design people. Um, I think that then if you start using the making, the telling, and the enacting in the analysis, then the making of stuff, you know, you're making things to represent what you've done through the analysis. You bring the making really early um, and bring it into the analysis. It helps you bridge that gap between the research and the design. Um, also, I think having, if you have a client um, that you're, you know what I mean, that's whoever's going to use this information, if you can get them involved in the interpretation and the analysis. Um, sometimes the best we can do is get, is summarize it, analyze it, and then get them involved in making implications from it. Because that all takes so long, so much time. But the, so again, the more collaborative it is, and the more you can add that, the, the making, telling, and acting into the analysis, the better off. Of course, that all takes time, which is money. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really interested in the um, ethnography, how you go from what you learn about participants and then their dreams, how you can go beyond the bubble of their experience when they're dreaming. How so they can go beyond the yeah, bubble? Yeah, so how during the during the making process, for example, how do um, I do work with children, co-design with children, and, and often their ideas will be either way out or totally dependent on what they've experienced. Um, and so it, it's almost like trying to, but what I found difficult is trying to work out how you can give kids a bunch of other options so they can dream beyond, but also it's not like a time machine or you know some of the, the yeah. outcomes they come. I'm just interested in if you have a technique that, that supports kind of thinking beyond what you know 
um, in your dreaming? Well, I, I think part of that would be in what are the materials, you know, what do you give them to work with? What, how do you prepare them? And what do you give them? But the other thing is if you get the children dreaming together and making together, then you get the sort of the near term and the far term people. If you can get them to collaborate through the making, um, th that is sort of a way that you can help resolve that. Now, depending on the age of the ch child, that's questionable. Yeah. You know, because if they're really little, they're not going to collaborate well. Yeah. But they'll um, dream well. Huh? But they'll dream well. They'll, they'll dream Some well. Yeah. Right. When, in fact, the whole, so I started doing participatory design totally intuitively because I was on projects with, because I didn't know it was a field at the time. This was in the early 80s. And I had projects with children, and I just, I, there, weren't, there wasn't any information that I could find that would help me answer the questions that the designers had about the products for children. So I just started involving them as participants. So m my whole um, experience started because I was working with preschoolers. You know, and they were semi-verbal. Yeah. yeah. And then I had to figure out how to get grown-ups to do it. And so a lot of the effort of preparing people and making the tools, because children you can just say, draw a picture. Yeah. But you can't do that with grown-ups. So a lot of effort went into um, getting this to work with grown-up people. Mm. So, sorry, can I ask another question just related mm -hmm. to this one? For example, if you had um, a health objective where you wanted to increase the health outcomes and they know that green space directly outside the window is good, but maybe the, the participants don't know that, um, is that something that is just in your process incorporated later or just ignored because they're not, they don't have that knowledge? Or So I, I guess my immediate response would be you might have you might precede the workshop with sort of did you know. Uh, okay. You might have six did you knows. And then you might have toolkit materials that let them pick up on that and let them put it into their whatever they make. Okay. Yeah. yeah, something like that is what I would do if I didn't think they knew it. Mm -hmm. If you remove um, limitations to get people to think broadly. Could you speak louder? Sorry, yeah. If you, um, if you remove limitations, to get people to think broadly, but the reality is that you have to apply those limitations later just because of reality. How do you manage their expectations and disappointment perhaps that they haven't been heard or that they've only partially been heard? It hasn't really, you haven't really executed exactly what they were asking for or as much as they were asking for? We, we tell them that um, we, we state that up front that we're going to ask you to dream, that we don't know, especially in hospital design, we don't know, that, you know, we, we probably can't deliver on a lot of your dreams because of rules, regulations, and requirements. So we, we, we deal with that up front. Um, and then in the, um, the architectural work, we would use language like, we would call it nurse, this, no, this other project, we, when we summarized um, when we summarized the results, we called it Nurse Dreamland. So it wasn't a layout, it, you know what I mean? It was, it was what they aspired to have or how they wanted to work, but they were well aware that it couldn't be delivered because they had, you know, balconies for people to smoke that were illegal and things like that. So we, yeah, we deal with it up front if we can. Um, a useful technique that we found Tell them to dream big, um, get all the crazy wild ideas out, and then um, then say, okay, look, we obviously can't do everything. Uh, what are the six things yeah. that you would really like? And listen to the way they prioritise amongst themselves. After that, say, now you can only have three. Which three you want? And even you'll see them come to a conclusion that that balcony for smokers is not actually even feasible and desirable anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting when they come to that conclusion. Yeah. So involving them, yeah. I would agree, involving them in those in those decisions. 
Yeah. Or even just the, the voting on each other's ideas gives you a feel. One, one thing that surprised me working in the architectural firm, I had sort of assumed that the value to the designers from doing this kind of work would be getting lots of ideas for the hospital room or the hospital floor. But the main, what, what we learned was the main value was getting prioritization of the ideas. They, they're like, we're designers. We can come up with ideas all day long. We just don't know which are the good ones. So that was just real interesting um, to learn that it wasn't about idea generation. It was about um, which, which, you know, which are the ideas that really mattered. And it, like on this project, the main, the main, um, the main thing that mattered to people who heart patients who tend to stay in the hospital weeks on end was a heavenly bed close to the bathroom. <laughs> but think about it: a heavenly bed with like real sheets and down pillows, you know, like heavenly, like at a high-priced hotel, but near the bathroom. Um, and that's not something that the architect knew um, before going into this. But this is a three-dimensional toolkit that um, we put together in um, when working in the architectural practice. I call it the dollhouse. And so this is a little further down the design process line. So what you have is um, it's scaled to the requirement of the size of the room, and the walls are plexiglass. So the wall, you know, you're constrained by the walls, but you can see through the walls. And so here, the nurses would get an opportunity to lay out the hospital room um, with the components. A lot of the components were ambiguous, so they could take on different um, meanings. Um, but what, what's amazing here, so I remember this session, these women worked in the same hospital on different floors, so they didn't actually, they never met um, each other. They shared their gripes about working in the hospital, and then they were given the opportunity to create this new hospital room from that table full of components in the back. Um, and I timed how long it took them to create the whole room. Does anybody want to guess how long it took three strangers to make all those decisions? I, I think here they had to work, they had to be creative to get within the constraints. Now, you notice what happened here is they cheated. <laughs> and see, I wasn't watching the whole time. The bathroom is beyond the footprint. So they got real creative. You know what I mean? They're like, oh yeah, she's not watching. Let's just get the bathroom out here. Um, so it isn't entirely useful in that way. But I think to the extent that they do have, this isn't dreamland. You know, this is all scaled. Um, I'm not sure if, if I have, oh, this is great. So in the same study, um, one of the teams said, well, our nursing station is much worse than the patient room. <laughs> So can we, just, can we just work on that for you? And I said, okay, that's fine. And so, what, so in a way that you, know, you gave them those constraints, but then they, they, you know what I mean? They could see the potential in the tools, as ambiguous as they were, to let us understand their situation here. So this was the bed. You know, this is what we thought was the bed. They turned it into a workstation. And you notice how they labeled everything to make sure we didn't get any of it wrong. <laughs> you know, they presented it all, but they, they knew that, um, yeah. So I think, yeah, having, it, and you notice here, we're farther down in the design process, too. So there's more constraints, there's more regulations, there's right. more requirements. Gotcha. So it is, here. it is, like, sometimes it's the creative mm -hmm. positions up. Uh, naturally and maybe more beneficial at right. that later stage. Yeah, they, they are more beneficial at that later stage. Um, but even so, with the, the parts and the pieces, like half of the parts and pieces were very concrete and specific, like toilets right. and sinks, and a lot of, you see, these pieces are all ambiguous. So they could turn them into anything they wanted. Um, but yeah, the further you are down in the stage, the less openness there is, but you can still build a lot of openness in um, through the parts and pieces. Uh, this is a, um, I call it Velcro modeling. Um, 
the, the, um, the base shapes are covered with Velcro, and so all the little components um, stick to it. And so this is a really, really fast way for people to make prototypes or prototypes, because um, everything just sticks together. A lot of times, this is done at the end of a session. So this um, lady is living with type 2 diabetes. And we've been through a lot of sort of experience mapping, discussing, and this and that. And here she decided to make a device from the Velcro because she didn't want to use the puppets. Um, and it was interesting. And it just, she, so she made this device. Um, it took her about one minute. And then she started talking about what it would do and how she would <laughs> use it and where she would put it and like 15 minutes later I had to ask her to stop because <laughs> once she made it she you know it just took a life of its own and she would start she would then start dictating the entire user interface mm -hmm. like oh when I ate a donut it would say this but when I ate a pear it would do this and then when I went for a drive I would put it in my anyway so it was um you know, with the, the timing is right, so it just, it was like, it's like a dream catcher. Okay, so it took all of these, this thinking that she'd done about living with diabetes, and what her problem was if she did something bad in the morning, like she ate something with a lot of sugar in the morning, she'd go, oh well, today is ruined. I'll wait until tomorrow to get back on my, on my track. Um, and so this, this device then would help her figure out what to do instead of just counting the day off and eating trash the rest of the day, it would help her get back on track. But anyway, it's um, just a, a, a simple three-dimensional, well, the toolkit has a lot of parts, for example, um, but the speed with which people can make dream catchers is, is amazing. This is um, a bigger set of the Velcro modeling, and what we're doing here, this is a workshop with um, um, hospital staff workers, um, designers, and so forth. This is, um, the people are exploring mobile technology. Now this is the ideal situation where you have, you know, free form making, telling. Some of the people are medical people, so the stories that are going on are going to be real, <laughs> and it's in a hospital. So they can make the devices, come up with a story, and then actually enact in full scale how these devices would work in the future. Okay, so the technology is anything, you know, they can, anything they can imagine, um, but this gives them the opportunity then to not only make it and talk about it, but test it out um, in a real situation with people who actually know something about healthcare and medicine. So that, that's sort of the ideal make, tell, and enact scenario. Um, in this situation, I was working with people at the European Commission, just giving them an opportunity to explore make tools. Um, kind of like what we're doing here, um, but it was a longer session, and we had a time to explore three-dimensional Material. So with this, this is a mapping of the migrant <laughs> crisis, the current situation um, where you have people coming um, to the border and attempting to get into Europe. And just, it's just interesting to look at the, um, how they were able to take really, really ambiguous components and not only create a lot of content, um, but a lot of emotional um, impact as well, and so here you have um, people, you know, lining up at the border, um, coming over across um, the ocean, um, drowning um, in the ocean, and um, if they're lucky, making it to Sweden. So anyway, so it was an exercise in learning by doing, but it, I thought it was an interesting, um, you know, combination of materials that let them create this big long scenario. The next step then was to, um, they actually changed this scenario into the ideal. They didn't make a new one, they just reconstructed it. Um, are those the words that you co-constructed with them? Like the ones, the ones that they if, Yeah, if the words are typed, we, they were 
in the toolkit for them to use. So if they were handwritten, see, a lot of handwritten words because we didn't have the words they needed. But it didn't really matter. They got the idea, yeah. use words too, um, and they had the words. So who, who are the actual people doing this? Huh? Who are the participants? The um, behavioral foresight people at the European Commission in Belgium. Mm -hmm. So what was their role? They do foresight. They, they do sort of uh, the, the looking ahead. They tend to do more scientific, so evidence-based foresight oh, okay. work. Yeah, yeah, okay. They're policy makers. Yes. Um, I think the, the unit was called Behavioral Insights and something, something. And so these people were interested and volunteered to come to the workshop to learn because they weren't using materials like this or methods like this. And so we picked a topic that was on their minds um, and invited them to explore it by exploring the tools and materials. Sorry, can I ask another question? Uh -huh. Did they, when they were doing their features, would they identify problems in the along the, the travel and yeah. then trying to address yeah. ways they go? Well, so what they did, first they did, here's the current situation. There were like four teams. They presented to each other and talked about the implications. Also talked about each team used different kinds of materials. Another group used mainly Legos. Um, so they, they could then compare, you know, the value of different kinds of materials. And then each team went back and they, we took a lot of pictures, and then each team went back and they could change it, the situation, to be a preferred state. Okay. Um, and it was basically a learning by doing kind of activity. I have several projects now where I'm exploring um, full-scale three-dimensional toolkits for exploring, in, in this case we're exploring creative spaces who bring people together, they share how they are creative as individuals, we throw them into teams and give them a big room and like two hallways full of stuff, like furniture, tables, drapes, like all kinds of stuff, and they make their own space for being creative together. Um, then they present it, there's several teams doing this at once, they present it and then they get to um, use it. They, they test it um, by doing some creative activity in it and then they can change it as they, they need be. So this has been, been an interesting, um, so the use of, so this is sort of an ideal situation where you have the making, the telling, and the enacting, and it's all full scale. Um, and it's really a powerful, and in these spaces, again, we, we, we were thinking, oh my gosh, how long is it going to take strangers to make all these decisions, to you know, pick all this stuff out and make these spaces, and again, it was like 10 minutes, because they were all like fighting over the same. You know, there, there wasn't like, there wasn't like four of the same item. It was just like a hallway, sort of grab and run kind of a situation. Um, so it's real interesting, we found some really, the, these were, we accidentally in one group teamed all the women together. So you just sort of get sort of a feel for the, the spaces here um, with a lot of sort of cozy, drapey, um, moody spaces. And then this was the guys. It was like just, Completely, huh? Very functional. Uh -huh. it's very functional. Very functional. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah, we did a lot of those groups. So using, um, I don't have pictures. I'm, I'm on a project now where we have a full-scale hospital room, which is all covered with Velcro, and it has all the pieces that can stick on the walls. And we, this is a project I'm doing with people in engineering. Um, we've had 23 different hospital staff roles. We've 180 people from 23 different roles have had the opportunity to make the ideal hospital room to work in, um, full scale and 3D. So really powerful. The analysis is huge. It's, it's really fun if you like analysis. If you don't like analysis, it would be torture. 
<laughs> especially with engineers. This, some, some grad students created a, um, a make tool kit that's networked. So they wanted to explore, well, what if, we could, what if it wasn't paper-based, what if it was networked so that people could collage together anywhere in the world? So this is just a shot. Um, so I think that um, with the making, you know, where it's going is it's going networked, it's going um, full scale. And you can imagine in the future we might have networked, immersive, full scale um, environment spaces for people to actually create their own virtual immersive spaces and then live in them or work in them or play in them. And I don't have any pictures of that. Yeah. Well, there's this technology that I came across um, based on swarm intelligence. Yeah. There's a, I think it's an organization, I don't know if it's based or a university in the States, but they have an online app. So people can log in and 30, 40 people can go into a problem or a question and yeah. there'll be like six choices and it'll be go, and then you'll just see the swarm of people move towards an outcome in seconds, like it virtually takes wow. seconds. Yeah, it's and, it's, and, and the decisions will be questions like who's going to win the upstairs or okay. who's this and the, and the uh, predictions of the group are more accurate than, than experts. experts. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. Did it? Did they have questions like that. Yeah. Oh, what's it called? Cool. It's, I think it's called U and U. Just going to call you in. Yeah, the implications for technology serving the design process or the co-design process are, are huge. The website is unu.ai. Unu.ai. Thanks. Yeah, that would be amazing for you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. How do you see the role of the facilitator in this one <coughs> online platforms? Oh, that's really interesting. There isn't really a facilitator, is there? Okay. The, facili the facilitator has chosen the items and determined how this works. Mm. Now, you notice only some of these are um, highlighted. So this has been set up so that each person only has access to a part of the toolkit. So that there's a um, incentive then for people to, and they're, they're creating their ideal learning environment. But because you can't get to some of these items, um, the incentive is to collaborate with your partner and create a shared one. So in a sense, the facilitation is built into the application by those sorts of like kind of rules for how it works. But that's interesting. Yeah, nobody's really watching it. Whoops. Yeah. Liz, I think um, when everyone does the exercise that we've got your role in the um, pretty clear like yeah <laughs> yeah there's a lot of comments yesterday yeah. about about my role as a facilitator because I um, I just like walk around and watch and ask do you need scissors you know mm -hmm. so I, I don't like I don't probe or direct <laughs> Uh, what my, my role as a facilitator is to create the learning, you know, create the space for you to do what you do in, and to make sure you have the stuff that you need. So, so you know, all my, my facilitation, like here, my facilitation is in planning it, making sure we have the right space, this and that, and making sure that there's time to present what you've done in the end, but I don't engage in a conversation with you while you're making. So how do you build rapport and trust in this kind of function? How do you build trust? So you talked about when you first start off with the yeah. group that you get them to share a personal story. Mm -hmm. Would you involve yourself as a facilitator in that process? <coughs> um, maybe, maybe not. Um, I, th I don't know, I've never been asked that question. I think um, it becomes really clear to people that I'm a better listener than a talker. Talk way more today than you had the last two days. Well, that's because I'm up here. Yeah, no, but like, I know. Yeah, I mean, I can talk, really quiet. Um, but I would rather. So I think when I'm in with a group, 
um, it becomes clear to them that it's all about them. And I'm there to listen and I'm there to help and support, but I'm not there to lead the conversation. But sometimes I have to like um, check the time and get bossy about the time kind of a thing. So, so I, just, I just sort of get out of the way as much as possible. If I need to be, if things aren't going well or if people are, if the activity is to make something and all they do is talk and they haven't made anything and the time's on, you know, then I might get in and make a few suggestions. Um, but if they just keep talking and they don't make anything, that's okay. They still have to present what they talked about. Yeah, so I guess I never really noticed that. Um, but my facilitation is planning it and then analyzing it. Would you also possibly make the sharing back? When yes. Your friends make the sharing back? Yeah, they will and always be sharing back. Do you have certain questions that you try to ask? You have After they're done sharing back, then I might ask for clarification or probe about certain things after they're done. But if I don't want to ask a question while they're presenting, because that might, they might think, oh, I'm not talking about the right thing. She wants me to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, so whatever they make, they, they will present, and they'll get as long as they need to present it. Um, but in a way, I would rather, I usually ask the other people to comment on it before I would comment on it. do it um, I, I guess I just do that intuitively because I, I tend to like to listen more than talk um, so in another word being moderating like that it helps to be an introvert uh, I think if you were quite extroverted and you like to keep the conversation going and keeping it lively there might be a tendency to add more um, and it may or may not lead the conversation so I'm very careful not to not to lead it Yeah, okay. When I follow up, um, she was asking me about how you build trust or like some of my colleagues come from organizational psychology and they have a few techniques in terms of um, so if someone is about to share or share some personal story or some personal experience, I should say it's emotional like asking the follow up question in a certain way, like do you want to tell us more about it so you can take trust in the choice to kind of share a bit more or not, because then they have the permission to say, oh, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, that it's like um, an active, active listening or you mentioned this and that. Uh, so like making sure that they know that they've been hurt and that yes. you kind of just that they can share something about that area or yeah. yeah, I think the more the most I get directive is like the timing. Like right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I want to make sure you have time for the making and the telling. There's going to be eight teams, so we have to have time to tell. So I'm going to like look through the rest of my slides and we'll have some more questions. This is a great discussion, but this is where, yeah, we have to make sure that you get all parts of the experience today. Um, but yeah, those are, those are good. You just, yeah, you just have to be very sensitive to, it's about them, right? Uh, with telling. I don't really have a lot on telling because I'm assuming that you're familiar with um, all kinds of different telling activities. Um, stories, diaries, uh, conversations, documentaries. There's many different sort of telling 
activities. You could include surveys, interviews, questionnaires. So telling is really all about sort of verbal, verbal exchange, whether it's out loud or written on paper. Um, and the telling is always, you always need to have, give people the opportunity to tell what they made. Um, because first of all, they want to tell you what they made. And second of all, you don't even know what it means. You know, there's, there's no way I would know what Zach did here, um, you know, without his explanation for it. Um, so you really need to have that in their words and give them the stage to do that telling. <laughs> Um, and from an architectural project here, this was a, a great example of um, a team of architects and hospital um, people spent a couple hours coming up with uh, a scenario for the patient experience eight years in the future, because it takes about eight years from beginning um, an architectural project to moving into the new hospital. Um, and so they had a lot of materials to use to create that ideal experience. Notice it wasn't the ideal doctor's experience or the nurse's experience. It was the doctors and the nurses and the architectural team talking about the ideal patient and family experience. Um, and so when they got up to present to the rest of the group, um, they went and, uh, I don't know if you can tell here, she got in her scrubs. They decided that instead of telling the story, they were going to act the story. So they changed their outfits, they assigned roles, and they actually presented it by enacting. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't ask them to do that. Um, it was just something that they felt would add to the story, and it was just a really, really effective way to present their work. So they played the roles of the patient, the family members, the doctors, the nurses, um, and so forth. So another sort of, you know, once you get all three of those going, um, it can be quite effective. Um, and acting, again, it, it changes form depending on where you are in the process. Um, these enacting methods are all published. There, there's a body of literature on enacting as a participatory design um, set of methods. Um, this is some of my grad students just exploring um, improv um, as a way to explore future scenarios. Um, I've also hired improv um, teachers um, to come in and train a group before they get into improv, which I would highly recommend um, having somebody experienced in it um, leading, leading the effort. So here are the puppets. And again, this is from the type 2 diabetes study. He decided he was going to tell a future scenario with puppets. Um, he's a very outgoing, outgoing guy. And you see that his wife is there too. She wasn't recruited. She just happened to be home when we showed up for the session. And she just happened to like sit there for the whole two hours, um, listening and commenting. Um, and so forth, because she's very concerned, um, and she was trying to support him, um, because he was not uh, following doctor's orders. But anyway, so you just kind of get the, um, he's telling a future story about living with diabetes. This is him, and this is her. She's going to keep nagging him, because he's not going to change. And he's probably not alive today. Um, this is actually, you know, improv and pretending. Um, the architectural firm designed a new hospital. They changed the shape of the hospital room in a way that had never been done before. The client was nervous because it wasn't a rectangle, the room. So they built a full-scale mock-up of the room and then had um, nurses and other staff people act out scenarios in the room to make sure the room worked. So it would be scenarios where a lot happened or a lot of people came into the room at one time mm -hmm. to test it out. And what was interesting on this project was, uh, I don't guess they, they planned that it would take all day. You know, they, they, they were there for the whole day and they were going to run different groups through the room and all of this. And within um, a half an hour, um, they'd already determined that the room was great. 
And then what happened was that um, the nurses started commenting on, well, you shouldn't have the hand sanitizer there. So the nurses, because everything was full scale and everything was rough, they started re they, they started giving input about all the things that the architects called the details. Like, where is the whiteboard? Where is the soap? Where is the sink? Where does the trash go? So they spent the whole day getting input on the things that the architects don't really um, specify until after the room is built, which was really quite interesting because if you're a nurse, those are not details. Um, so that, that was just an interesting experiment. Um, so I have a couple of uh, cases, and I'll go through these really quickly. This was a project that I did with a team at the University of Bath in the UK, and their client was um, was it uh, wastewater? What was a uh, Wessex water? So they're having a trouble in some rural communities with people flushing things down the loo, as they called it, that you shouldn't flush down the loo, or pouring grease into the sink. So things would clog up the sewage system. And this project was exploring, um, you know, why are people doing that? How can we get people not to be doing that? And so forth. So it was sort of a community. We went out to the community. Um, <laughs> The first thing we did, we recruited people and they had a, a workbook, a fairly significant workbook where they could log their wastewater practice habits. And pretty much everybody was like claimed to be doing all the right things. Um, along with the workbook came some, you know, giveaways um, that would help them. Um, and then they, they came and, and met and their first activity was to uh, create personas. Uh, how many of you are familiar with persona? Okay, in this case, it's the, the citizens are creating the personas. So we're not creating personas based on what we learn of the citizens. We're asking the citizens to make the personas with the citizen making toolkit. So these, these were the pictures of the people they could choose. And we knew from the workbooks, everybody thought they were good wastewater stewards or whatever. And so the task was to create personas of other people that they knew or knew of, other people who had different attitudes about wastewater. Um, and to pick extreme characters. <coughs> Um, and so what they did then is they created personas. So we, we gave them the toolkit so that they could, you know, it has typical persona categories, but they actually then made up these characters and it revealed um, sort of the extremes of um, the citizens and revealed some of their thinking um, about, you know, why people don't follow good wastewater practices. So this was pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and again, just um, different, different scenarios. We got a lot of characters then. Um, in the second stage, um, we gave them um, a toolkit through which they could map ecosystems of wastewater management for their community based on the characters that they created. So now they're thinking about, you know, these people that um, continue to pour grease down the sink or whatever, um, and they're, they're mapping out um, systems solutions. Um, again, a collaborative effort. So these actually turned out um, better than we anticipated, you know, because these aren't systems thinkers necessarily. These are just citizens that are concerned with um, the wastewater situation. So this was... Uh, um, this was uh, it's a really, a really fun project, um, and again, with volunteer citizens. Um, but having them make the personas is a good way to sort of get at things people don't, do, they know, but they don't really want to tell you. Or it might be about them, but they don't want to admit it's about them, but they can put it on another person um, and tell you a lot in that way. Um, this is a project where I was supporting a, gradu a Norwegian graduate student who did the actual work. Um, in co-designing with children in Cambodia. And so she was working with 
a small group of children who had lost a leg, a, a limb, to um, landmines in Cambodia. Um, and these are some of the publications from the work. And so she was co-designing not only with the children, but with um, stakeholders in the process, stakeholders that would be involved in creating the prosthetic limbs for these children um, in Cambodia. So just some of the activities, the children mapped out um, what they do um, during the day. Um, it, was, it was very difficult to do the work. She had to work through a translator. The children, um, the children had been brought up to believe they didn't really have a voice. Um, and so it took quite a long time for her to gain the trust of the family and of the children. Um, and this exercise was really effective um, where the child could um, choose the male or female and then show her um, how they would, what they would wear at home, at school, and going into the town so she could understand um, better how they felt about the prosthetic limb and whether they wanted to hide it, disguise it, or make it look pretty or whatever. Um, she also, talk, this is a really culturally sensitive toolkit for exploring the kinds of materials that could be available um, to use in producing um, prosthetic limbs in Cambodia. Um, and so all of this work um, was done just to kind of figure out what kind of materials she could bring to a three-dimensional modeling session with the stakeholders. So it's a, just a lot of cultural, um, a lot of extra work because she's in a different culture with a whole different set of needs and a different sort of geography um, in order to make the work um, culturally sensitive. See, and you see here just really, really early, early prototypes um, of ideas made by um, stakeholders involved in supplying or producing um, these sort of limbs for the children. And the final case study, this is um, a project I did with graduate students from uh, my graduate students from design and other graduate students from other departments. Uh, Westminster Thurber is a, they call it a continuing care community. It's a, um, a retirement community um, that takes care of, once you join, you're taken care of through the end of your life. So you, you move there and that's the last place um, you live. And so um, the graduate students and a large team of volunteers spent weeks sort of trying to figure out, well, what are we gonna do together? Um, because it was totally open. There really weren't any constraints there other than it's a co-design studio. And I think the seniors were sort of thinking that um, you know, there ought to be a plan. We, we want to know what we're doing. And the students were like, well, we're exploring. Um, the seniors, they were like great sport. You can see the very, the very first meeting, they're confronted with all these make tools. Because um, I just sort of let the students go with, with whatever they wanted to do. Um, and it, it just, it started, it was, there was a little confronting at first, but they, um, they did it. They were able to express thoughts and feelings with, with blocks and shapes. And eventually, like halfway through the semester, they agreed on they were going to make an app that people could use, people such as senior citizens, children of the seniors, relatives or whatever, an app that people could use to figure out where to spend the rest of their lives not which retirement community to go to, but did they want to move in with the child? Did they want to hire help at home? Did they want to just try to live in their own home with occasional help, or did they want to remove to a community? Um, because the seniors drove the decision. They felt, they felt incredibly happy to be at this community, but they had friends who made other decisions or they had friends whose children made the decisions for them and it wasn't working out. And so they spent um, the rest of the semester um, actively, this is just sort of the overall flow, um, screen by screen developing this with the seniors um, not only taking part at every step of the way, but uh, at one point the students were gone for two weeks because of spring break and something. The seniors just kept going. 
and when the students came back, they just like teased them. You know what I mean? They just kept working because they had the plan, they knew where it was going, um, and they continued to meet without um, the students. Um, what they did was developed um, a prototype. The app hasn't been programmed. We don't have. We didn't have any programmers, which is a big disappointment. Um, but the whole process of going through it, the whole it's it's storyboarded out, and this is sort of the results screen um, of a decision process. Um, all of that was developed um, within the course of say ten. Weeks and here you can see um, not everybody on the team, but um, most of the students then um, together. Um, two years later, we came back to this community with other projects. Some of the seniors came back, um, and one of the outputs this year it's a book on how to start the conversation about stopping driving. Okay, not how to know, you know, it's not like stopping it's like just how to talk about it an entire book and again driven by the seniors so i think that's it yeah okay. Thank you.